All right. So transport in multicellular organisms. We've got to look at how transport within cells is similar and involved in transport in a multicellular organism. So we've already talked a little bit about how osmosis is used for plants to regulate their water loss. Well, osmosis is also the most important cell transport uh, method for transporting water within a plant from the roots to the leaves. Okay, and we're going to look at how that works as well. All right. We got to look at how nutrients, water, sugar, and minerals are transported in vascular plants, the structure of vascular plants, and what forces are involved. And then next week we'll do a lab where we'll cut a piece off of some of my plants here. Okay, we'll put them in uh, food coloring and we'll watch where the water goes through them. You probably did this in elementary school with a stick of celery. Okay, uh, with a stick of celery though, the food coloring just goes everywhere. Right, uh, the one, the way we're going to do this is we'll actually be able to see where the stomates are on the bottom of the leaves because that's where the dye will go and only go. All right, so we we're able to trace it a little more. We're also going to measure how much water moves through the plant okay, to get an idea of how much water a plant uses okay, over the course of about 48 hours. Okay. All right. And again, the pictures are not showing up here. OK, hang on, guys. I don't know what this goes. OK. So the resources that a plant needs are spatially separated. That means they're not in the same place. Okay, what are the resources a plant needs? Please, carbon dioxide, sunlight, water. Okay, as well as some of the nutrients that would be found where? In the water, so from the soil. Okay, so the water and nutrients are in the soil. Carbon dioxide and sunlight are not. So those two resources are not in the same place. Therefore, a terrestrial plant needs to have different parts that are capable of acquiring those resources and then the ability to transport those resources from one place to the other. Okay? So we talked about how yesterday, if we're looking at a terrestrial plant, like let's say this one here, okay, which is like cassava, okay, the underground part of the plant cannot carry out what? It can't carry out photosynthesis. It's not that its cells don't have chloroplasts. Okay, they often do. They're inactive, and there aren't very many. Okay, just because all plant cells kind of have those. But it's underground, and there's no light, so it can't carry out photosynthesis anyway. Um, however, it is specially designed to have uh, different types of cells that can um, create what's called osmotic pressure, so they can make it so that water will rush into the cells and then be transported up the plant. All right, so they're specialized to do a certain job. Whereas the parts of the plant that are above the ground, they need to be protected from evaporation, so they're sealed in with a waxy cuticle. They can't absorb any water, but they're out there in the sun. Their chloroplasts can work and carry out photosynthesis. So they've got to have ways of moving those materials. Okay, so uh, the soil provides water and minerals, but there's no light underground. So the body of a vascular plant is separated or differentiated into roots and shoots. Okay, roots and shoots. Now, there's different survival tactics that plants will use. Okay, we're going to look at some kind of common ones here. The, the first one here is like strawberries and raspberries. Okay, how many people have strawberries or raspberries at home? All right, um, what do the raspberries do? Ever notice like after a while, after you've had them for a while, you start seeing them in other places other than where you planted them? Okay, and it's not because raspberries have fallen on the ground and actively seeded. It's because, like strawberries, they will put out what's called a stolon. Okay, if the parent plant or the original plant begins to get mature enough that it's using up the nutrients in a certain area, it'll put out a stolon, which is kind of like a specialized root that'll just grow over to a new spot and start growing a new plant in that spot. That spot has more nutrients, and now the two are connected. So if this one runs out of nutrients over here, this one can transport some of the nutrients back to the original plant. Okay, I know for me, like my raspberries, they start coming up in the middle of the lawn, which is really annoying. Okay, and if you pull on them, you like follow the root back to the original plant as you pull it out of the ground. Okay, um, and strawberries do a similar thing. That's why they kind of crawl as well. Okay, any of those plants that seem to crawl do this. Okay? It's a way for them to acquire nutrients from new areas by kind of colonizing a new spot. All right, so that's one survival tactic. Okay, uh, another one would be uh, underground energy storage structures. 
All right, cassava and potatoes both do this. Okay, they have underground energy storage. So they, uh, as they carry out photosynthesis, the shoot system anyway, it makes more energy than the plant can use. Right? If you've ever looked at a potato plant, they, actually, they have a fair amount of leaves, but they never get very tall. Okay? They kind of spread out a little bit, but they don't try to actively you know, get all this above ground growth. A lot of the energy goes down into the roots, into what we call the tuber, okay? or the potato in this case. Okay? Um, and what it turns into is starch. Okay? And starch is plant fat. Okay? We store energy, if we have an excessive energy, we store it as fat, plants store it as starch. All right? um, and so that's why we want to eat these. Okay? They've got lots of, lots of energy stored in them. Okay? Potatoes, um, cassava, things like that, uh, turnips, beets, okay? all those kind of things are very high energy foods. That's why um, if you are going on a diet and you're looking to lose weight, the first thing you should probably cut out of your diet are French fries. Okay, because we're talking about plant fat fried up in animal fat. Okay, like that is a high energy combination. All right, now if you're starving and you're wanting to put on some weight, chow down on them french fries. All right, because they got tons and tons of calories. I'm not saying they're healthy for you, but they have tons and tons of calories in them. Okay, because of the way we cook them. All right, a baked potato. Okay. Obviously, is a lot healthier than, than French fries are, okay? especially if they're deep fried. Right? Um, now, with a, with a potato, this is where the plant will grow from the following year. Okay? I mean, potatoes can seed themselves, okay? but they'll actually grow from the tubers as well. You've probably noticed this if you've ever left potatoes too long in the pantry. They start to get eyes. If you leave them for a really long time, they get legs, and they turn into a spider-looking thing. Okay. I actually had that one time. I had this. I had left these potatoes in my basement because I'd grown too many and I couldn't eat them all. And I said, well, I'll put them down in the basement where it's cool and they'll keep down there. And I forgot about them. And I came down there like, I don't know, it was like a month later or something like that. And out of the box, cardboard box I had put them in was this long purple leg okay, that had grown out of this thing. I opened it up and it looked like there was a, like a whole bunch of giant purple-legged spiders in this box because all the potatoes had grown these long uh, sprouts. Okay? And the sprouts have little purple leaves on them because they're trying to find some light so they can start carrying out photosynthesis. So when you seed potatoes, you take a potato, you cut it in half and you throw it in the ground and it'll start growing these little shoots. Some of the shoot will get above the ground and start carrying out photosynthesis and from that point on it can make enough energy to sustain itself. It doesn't need to use the energy from the from the potato. If you've read The Martian or watched The Martian movie, the movie's not quite as good as the book, okay, um, that's what he does. Okay? He cuts all those potatoes up and puts them in the ground and they grow from there. Okay? And that's where they get the energy from to grow. By the way, The Martian is also a very cool book. Read it first. Okay? All right. Um, other other uh, kind of survival tactics would be things like onions. Onions also store their energy, but they don't store it in their roots, okay? like, uh, like potatoes do. They actually store it in the base of the leaves, which is why potatoes are kind of bitter and onions are kind of sweet, okay? because they don't store it as starch. They store it more as complex carbohydrates or sugars, okay? kind of longer sugars, so they're sweeter. All right? And obviously, they don't look the same. You can actually see the leaf structure in the bulb of the onion. All right. Now, an important adaptation of vascular plants is a protein called lignin. Okay. Lignin is like cement. Okay. And I don't want you to confuse cement with concrete. Those are two different things. Okay. Without cement, there's no concrete. Right. So if you are mixing concrete, you mix essentially sand, gravel, water, and cement together. Cement's the gray powdery stuff. Okay? You put those three things together. What the cement does is it acts like a glue that adheres to the rocks, the gravel, and the sand, and it makes this matrix that's very hard. When it hardens, it's, it's then concrete. Okay? And if you don't mix it right, the concrete is weak and it cracks or crushes easily. Right? You've probably seen that in sidewalks in town, right? In, in the new areas where they're building things, the, the concrete always breaks because they drive heavy stuff over it, okay? or they didn't mix it right. Um, if you mix it right, it gets this nice solid matrix that's very difficult to break. Well, lignin does the same thing with the cell walls of the cells in the stem. Okay? So 
the cells will secrete this protein, okay, this lignin, and it becomes fibrous and hard and cements the cell walls together so that they become hard. Okay? What do we call plant material that's hard? Wood, exactly. This is where wood comes from. Okay? Wood is lignified cell walls. Okay? It's plant concrete. That's what it is. Okay? That's why it's so much harder than kind of the fleshy parts of plants. Plants like this, like this house plant over here, okay, and this one, and even those ones over there, don't make very much lignin, okay? which is why this big plant here has to be supported by broomsticks and bamboo and stuff like that because it can't support itself doesn't have enough lignin in there. It's depending almost entirely on cell walls and water vacuoles in order to support itself, which when you get this to all and have all this leafy stuff is just not enough. Okay, now palms on the other hand, like this one, okay, like this dragon palm, they make a lot of lignin and drop a lot of leaves when I shake them. Okay, but lignin is not only very strong, but also kind of flexible, right? You don't want, as a plant, to be completely rigid okay you need to have some flexibility if you don't when the wind comes up they just break okay now if you've ever seen palm trees in a hurricane i mean they can bend so they're almost touching the ground in one direction without breaking okay they'll whip back and forth okay um and and they're much more flexible than let's say like a pine tree or a, a poplar tree or things like that that we would have around here now that said ours can move around quite a bit as well okay you guys have all seen that, right? In the wind, the trees just kind of move around and shake. Okay, so lignin, when the plant is alive anyway, okay, can also be strong and flexible, kind of the best of both worlds there. Okay, um, lignin is also used as a hard covering for certain kinds of seeds. Okay, so if you're looking at like nuts, okay, they all have a lignified shell around the, around the seed. Okay, and that's what protects them. It's very hard, okay, it doesn't break down easily, and... The idea behind that is that the seeds don't come out right away. It might take a few years before the shell of the nut breaks down enough that the seeds actually get out. And that gives the plant that produced the seeds time to get old and die before the new seeds germinate and have to compete with it. Okay. Um, in Canada, we have a lot of uh, pine trees that make uh, cones that are covered in a resin. If you've ever seen really kind of tightly packed or closed up pine cones, Okay, not the kind that come off a spruce tree. Those are very loose. But they're, they're packed very tight, and they actually have kind of a sticky covering on them. Those ones won't open unless there's a forest fire. Okay, it requires a forest fire to burn the resin off and cause the pine cone to crack open. So the seeds don't get released until the plants that produce them are dead. Right? And then those plants don't have to compete with these healthy, adult, mature plants that would shade them out. Okay, so it's all kind of adapted kind of for those purposes. All right, so remember what lignin is. Okay, it's embedded in the cell walls and helps with support, especially for things that are really tall, like a giant sequoia, right, which can be hundreds of meters tall. Right? There's some of these in California that they've actually cut holes in and you can drive an RV through. Okay, it was easier to cut a hole in the tree than it was to cut the tree down and make a road. Okay, so you just drive right through the tree. Okay. All right, turgor pressure, okay? Pressure of water in water vacuoles. The star of my show today is the plant over there, which right now is healthy because I watered it. I torment my plants so that I can use them in demonstrations for you, okay? This was the plant before I watered it. It looks very sick, okay? Because there's no water in the vacuoles, okay? The vacuoles have all been, there's been so much evaporation from the leaf that the spongy layer in the leaf is just full of salt and it's drawing water from the surrounding cells out by osmosis okay we don't normally want that to happen okay water vacuoles aren't meant to be a water reserve of any kind they're meant to support the plant but when we get into this stressful situation the water vacuoles lose their water and then the cell walls on their own aren't enough to maintain the shape of the plant and the plant wilts okay now these plants, they can recover as long as they're not crunchy. Okay, you can, they can recover. You give them some water and they spring right back. All right, those ones there, like it, that's kind of how I know when to water them. I just, I just wait 
because I always forget to do it. And then I look at them and go, oh man, those look really sick. They look like that. Okay. And then I water them and the next day they look like this again. They perk right back up. Okay. Those water vacuoles fill back up and suddenly that trigger pressure is back. The leaves are all upright and, and hard. Okay. So they can face the sun again. All right. Making sense? Okay, so that's what wilting is. So turgor pressure, okay, that's an important term. That's the pressure of water in the vacuoles. Okay, it contributes to the support of small plants, okay, but it's the skeleton of lignified walls that holds up a tree, okay, or something larger. All right, parts of the plant. Roots. There's different kinds of roots. Ever notice that? Okay, like a carrot looks a lot different from like let's say the roots of a bean okay a carrot is a tap root okay it goes down very very deep okay and grows little tiny root hairs off of it and and stores a lot of energy whereas for a bean they have a more fibrous root system that kind of spreads out a bit more both have their advantages and disadvantages obviously a fibrous root system doesn't have the ability to store a lot of energy. A taproot does. Okay. Which one has access to more surface area? The fibrous one. They can grow kind of everywhere. All right. And a fibrous root can the plant can kind of decide whether it wants its roots near the surface or if it wants them to go deeper down and it can spread them out. Okay. Whereas a taproot has one choice. Deep. Okay. Now, taproots can get really deep. You ever tried to pull a can to thistle? Okay. You pull a Canada thistle, and there's often it's often longer underground than it is above ground. Okay, they can have tap roots that are four or five feet deep. Okay, which is why it's almost impossible to kill one by yanking it out of the ground. If you leave any part of the root in the ground, it'll grow back from the root again. Okay, so you kind of have to spray them chemically okay, to get rid of them. All right, but they have this long, long tap root. Dandelions, same thing, long tap root. Okay, if you've ever pulled one of those, sometimes they snap off and you can see that white circle that you know is going to grow into another yellow flower okay, in a couple of days. And I don't know, I'm kind of obsessive about my lawn. I can't stand to see little yellow flowers in it. Okay, but tap roots, they get really, really deep. Okay, and most weeds have a tap root because it allows them to get deeper than the surrounding plants and it doesn't allow, then they don't have to compete with the surrounding plant roots. They're deeper than they are. Okay? If it gets dry, they're the ones that survive where your grass dies because its roots aren't very deep. Okay? Things like that. All right. Um, now, let's think of some other example plants. What about a cactus? Like those saguaro cactuses that grow in Arizona. Which root system do you suppose they have? It is fibrous. Most people want to say taproot because they're thinking, oh, there's never rain, it never rains in the desert, so they probably need these really deep roots. The problem with that logic is it never rains in the desert. So does it matter how deep your root is? No, it's dry, dry, dry. Unless it, your root can get deep enough that it hits an aquifer, okay, like a, an underground, like a well or something like that, which some plants in the desert do, like mesquite bushes will grow taproots that can be like 20 meters deep. They get deep enough to tap an aquifer and they survive. Okay, but but uh, saguaro cactus, their roots might only be about, let's say, five to ten centimeters deep. Okay, so not very far, somewhere in there. But they spread out up to 50 meters away from the plant. That way, when it does actually rain, I say it never rains in the desert, but it does occasionally. But it never gets a chance to absorb into the soil. So if your roots are right at the surface, you can get that stuff when it arrives before it evaporates. If your roots are too deep, then you won't get anything. All right, so they typically have a fibrous root system. Grass usually has a fibrous root system. Um, beans, like we said, have a fibrous root system. These are, these are the roots of a bean, actually. And they've got these little nodules on them. Anyone know what those do? I didn't expect that you knew. They actually contain bacteria that can take nitrogen from the atmosphere. And remember that our atmosphere is like almost all nitrogen. It's mostly nitrogen. Okay? They can take nitrogen out of the air and turn it into nitrates, which is what's in fertilizer. So beans can grow really well, even in nutrient-poor soil, because they can access nitrogen that other plants can't. 
This is usually why farmers who are trying to grow things organically without the use of fertilizer will rotate their crops to include beans every couple of years because the beans will actually put nitrogen back into the soil without them having to add it chemically. Because right? when you harvest the beans, you leave the roots. Okay? You leave the roots there, all this nitrogen is concentrated in those roots, they start decomposing, the nitrogen gets released back into the soil. Okay? So it's kind of a way to do that. All right, stems. So the main purpose of the stem supports the plant, okay, and transports nutrients, okay. Those are its two main jobs. So it's kind of like a, an elevator shaft in the middle of a skyscraper, okay. Elevator shafts are usually part of the structure, structural girders and, and kind of skeleton of a skyscraper, okay. Kind of the, some of the strongest parts, so they support it, but they also transport the people in, in the building from top to bottom, okay, and bottom to top. All right, so that's what they're doing. Um, they have to have lots of turgor pressure, especially if they're a small plant like these ones are, because they're not going to make a lot of lignin. Okay? If they're a bigger plant, then they'll have more fibers, more lignin, okay? and they'll be uh, stronger. This is usually where we'll find the bud system as well. Okay? The buds are usually put on, on the stem. Okay? Uh, reason for that, it allows the plant to choose where it grows its foliage. Foliage means leaves. Um, the, the biggest problem plants have is that things want to eat them. Okay, things come along and graze on them. So if you're your grass, you see a cow, you tremble, okay, because you know he's coming to get you. He's your predator. Okay, it would be like if you were a, a gopher and you saw a coyote. Okay, if you're grass and you see a cow, you're in trouble. Okay, um, but after the the plants are grazed on and eaten, they grow back. Okay, and they grow back from the buds that are further down. So a plant has the ability to replace lost foliage. So if somebody cuts off, and that's what's happened in this picture, they've cut this spot off right here. Okay, well, to replace all the foliage that was on that part of the stem, the two buds that were circled here in black start growing into new foliage. Okay, because in those buds are those parenchyma cells we talked about yesterday, the stem cells that can become anything the plant requires. So they can become stem, leaves, whatever it needs. All right, so that's typically how they do that. And we make sure that we use that in some of our gardening techniques. How many people have like a hedge near their house? Okay, or you've driven by the cemetery? Okay, cemetery there up on Big Rock. Okay, they, they have the caraganas around the edges and they trim those every year but if you look closely all of their leaves are on the very outside there's almost no leaves on the inside because the more you trim them the more they grow from that very outside edge so you get a very dense leaf layer on the outside but almost nothing on the inside that's how you train a hedge to look the way it does you constantly trim it and make it grow from just a little bit further back trim it make it grow from just a little bit further back and it looks more full okay and that's that's kind of the idea behind a hedge all right um, so all of that's kind of taking that into account questions there all right the leaves important to know how again the leaf structure okay the, this is like the third diagram of leaf structure you've seen now in the last two days is it important yes make sure you know the C3 leaf. I'm never going to test you on the C4 leaf. Okay, you don't have to worry about that one. Okay, so um, a typical plant leaf again has that upper epidermis. Okay, that we talked about there that secretes the waxy cuticle that covers the leaf. We got the palisade layer. You don't have to use the term mesophyll. You can just say layer. Okay, palisade layer that has all those photosynthetic cells. They're packed in there really tight, so we get lots of surface area for photosynthesis. Okay, underneath that we've got the spongy layer, and you don't have to use the term mesophyll. Okay, spongy layer where the cells are very irregularly shaped, and that makes pockets just like a sponge that can hold water, carbon dioxide, and oxygen. Okay, um, at the bottom of the leaf are the stomates. Okay, and remember that stomates are made out of guard cells, one on each side. Okay, that can open and close the stomate. Uh, we got the lower epidermis, which is the same as the upper epidermis, secretes a waxy cuticle on the bottom. Okay, inside of the spongy layer is where the transporting veins are. In the leaf, we call them veins, but in the stem, they have different names. Okay, so the uh, outside layer here looks different than the inside layer of the vein. Reason for that, the outside layer of the vein transports sugar back to the roots. The inside layer 
transports water up to the leaf. Okay. Now, there's some reasons why the water transporting stuff is on the inside, but most of it has to do with osmosis. Okay. Um, when you get water in here, it's drawn out through the, the cells that are conducting the, the sugar, and that keeps the sap from getting too thick. Okay, keeps it kind of runny and prevents it from slowing down when it's running. All right, so leaves are the photosynthetic organ of the plant. Okay, leaves have veins, which we just talked about. Okay, they can be arranged in a number of ways. They vary extensively in form, but they all have this general structure. Okay, this is the blade. This is the stalk. And where the leaf meets the plant, there's usually kind of a little protuberance of some kind there, and that is called the petiole. Okay. Grasses don't have petioles because they don't grow off of a branch. Okay. They grow directly from the roots. Okay. So the blade is kind of the flattened part. Okay, that does the majority of the photosynthesis, and the stalk is the part that holds it up. And the petiole is basically what's left of the bud that that particular thing grew from. All right, so remember, layers of the leaf or structure of the leaf is something you need to know, but not just for memorization, but as examples of cells that are specialized to do a certain job. Okay, transporting plants. If you've got a giant sequoia that's 150 meters tall, how in the heck is water getting from the roots to the leaves? That's a long way to move water directly against gravity. How do they do it? Exactly. Okay. They use osmosis to draw the water from the roots to the leaves. Osmosis can actually create enough of a pressure okay, that it will draw the water up. Okay. Um, the way for that to work, though, is that the tubes have to be microscopic. Okay. They can't be like a straw. Right? If they were like a straw, the column of water that would be inside the straw would be too heavy. Right? And the polar nature of water wouldn't be able to support that column of water, and it would simply fall back down. Okay? Uh, you probably noticed that you can, if you have a really, really small straw, you can't draw very much water through it, but you can draw it very easily without having to suck on the straw very hard. But if you have one of those big, giant, like, slurpy straws, okay, and you're trying to draw water up it, you have to pull a lot harder on that because the column of water that's in there is way bigger and way heavier, so it requires more suction. Okay? If you or I were to have a, a straw, let's say maybe about chest high, it would be nearly impossible for us to draw water that, up that. We wouldn't be able to create enough of a pressure differential to draw water that high. Okay? Now plants have to create enough of a water differential to move water over 100 meters in some cases, and they can only do it if the tubes are super, super small. Okay. All right, so we talked about the polar nature of water back in the chem unit, but this is where it's going to come back into play. The insides of these tubes, this is under an electron microscope to give you an idea, okay? This distance is 100 micrometers, so about the size of your, like, euglena, maybe, okay? Maybe a little bigger than your euglena, all right? Look how small these are in comparison, all these little xylem tubes. Okay. The biggest xylem tubes might be 50 micrometers in width. So the amount of water that's in that tube isn't very much. But how many tubes are there? A lot, right? They're all tiny, but they're all packed right together. Okay? So there's tons and tons of tubes, but they're all individually very, very small. So when you've got the inside of that tube, okay, you've got water sticking to the edges of the tube by what process? adhesion, right? So a hydrogen bond between water and the inside of the stem. And you've got water hooking to itself by cohesion, hydrogen bond between the water molecules. 
if this if the uh, tube is too wide you have too many unsupported water molecules in the middle okay the hydrogen bonds aren't strong enough to hold together and the water goes back down okay but if the tubes are really 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 tiny okay then it's no problem your water molecules can stick to the side and these two water molecules can support that one that's not stuck to anything through the hydrogen bonds but the tubes have to be small all right so here's the processes you have this numbered diagram okay in your notes okay, in your notes package and then there's a numbered list that talks about each process okay so process number one is the roots absorbing water from the soil osmosis is involved in that as well okay movement of water always has to do with osmosis it's moving across a membrane from the soil and into the plant so it's got to cross their membranes so those cells have to create a concentration of solutes inside their cells that's greater than outside and that will draw the water in okay the water will come in and then once it's in there there has to be a higher concentration of salts up here in the leaves than there is down at the bottom okay so how does that occur well as water is moving up the plant it's also evaporating from here and what's it leaving behind when it evaporates the same salts that were used down here to draw the water into the plant. So it leaves them behind here and creates an imbalance of salts that needs to be balanced by osmosis. So more water moves up in order to balance that salt concentration that's at the top. Okay. Now, you probably noticed, especially this year, because we didn't have very much rain this year, that a lot of sloughs dried up. Okay. What do you notice about the ground where they dry up? Notice what color it is? When a puddle dries up or kind of a small slough dries up, the ground around it's always white. Okay, where it was? Because it's left behind all the what? All the solutes, all the minerals, they all get left behind. Do things grow very well in that dirt? Not very well. Okay, even though there's lots of moisture there, there's too much salt there. There's so much salt in the soil that water actually gets pulled the wrong way if you're a plant. You can't create enough of an imbalance at the top of the plant to be greater than the salts that are outside the plant. Okay, which is why plants can't grow in salty conditions. Why you can't water a plant with salt water, it'll kill it. Okay, in the same way that drinking salt water would kill you. Okay, it's going to draw water out of you by osmosis instead of allowing the plant to do what it wants to do, which is use osmosis to pull water up. Okay, so uh, so step three. Okay, uh, sorry. Step two is showing just um, cellular respiration. Okay, it's showing the the burning of the sugars that were produced up here by photosynthesis. So oxygen comes in, carbon dioxide gets released, and and cellular respiration in the mitochondria of the cells takes place down here because these cells can't carry out photosynthesis. Okay, water's moving up in what are called the xylem tubes. We'll talk about those in just a minute. Okay, water moves up in the xylem tubes, which are in the middle of the plant. Water evaporates from the leaves through the stomates. Okay, something that's a term we got to know. Okay, so it evaporates through the stomates and leaves salts behind in the spongy layer, and those salts bring the water up by osmosis. Okay, during that, the reason the water evaporates is to facilitate this process. Okay, carbon dioxide comes in, light is added, oxygen gets released. This is photosynthesis that produces sugar. The sugar moves down in the phloem tubes, and the phloem tubes are on the outside of the stem. Okay? And those go down and feed the cells of the roots and of the trunk, if the trunk is woody, because okay? it won't be able to carry out photosynthesis for itself either. All right, so we've got, with, um, with that transport, obviously, we have to remember that this cellular transport process is crucial. Okay, we've got to understand that osmosis is necessary for plants to move water. So, cellular transport process being used on a large multicellular scale. Okay, would diffusion be able to pull that off? Absolutely not. Diffusion's not targeted, and it only works over short distances. We can see now that osmosis can actually work over very large distances, not just across the membrane, but it can actually create enough pressure that it can pull water 100 meters. Okay, so it's a big deal. All right, so these are, again, that's the list that we just went over, so we'll just skip past that because we just did it. Okay, transporting water in plants. So these are the two tissues, okay? The phloem 
and the xylem. Okay, xylem's for water, phloem's for sugar. We kind of looked at these yesterday a little bit when we talked about multicellularity. Okay, the phloem is near the outside of the plant. The xylem is dead phloem cells, so they're on the inside because each year the plant adds layers to the outside of the plant. That's what make this, makes the tree rings and all that stuff. Okay, um, so the uh, the if we're looking at it this way, okay, the xylem, like we said, is kind of on the inside. And you can see that the sieve plates, these things here, okay, have kind of broken down and they don't really have the, the small holes anymore, so water travels through them easily. But on the outside, when there's still a phloem cell, okay, the sugar travels through those. Big crystals get broken up by the sieve plates, keeps the, um, the sap flowing okay, through there. And there's layers of living cells in between. So what would happen if the phloem got damaged? The sap will leak out of the tree. If the sap's leaking out of the tree, where is it not getting to? The roots. Okay. Um, some buddies of mine in university and I, I have to admit that I was part of it, um, we used to have this nice open grassy area behind our dorm where we'd go out and play football when it was nice in the spring and in the fall. and uh, the forestry faculty, the faculty of forestry, uh, Department of Forestry and the Faculty of Science, they decided they were going to do some field work and they were going to transplant some of these giant spruce trees from somewhere, who knows where. And they brought them in and they decided that the grassy place where we played football was a good place to transplant these trees to. So they transplanted these trees, which kind of makes it difficult to play football. Because right? you're, you're running around, you run into trees, the ball hits a tree. It made it very difficult. We decided we didn't like that very much. They had done all this work, moved these trees in. We had one guy who we called him the tree mugger. He was also in forestry. Um, he said, well, I got a way to get rid of those. We'll just ring them. I'm like, look, we can't go out there with a chainsaw and cut these trees down. People will see us. He's like, no, 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 we're not going to cut them down. We're just going to kill them. Like, well, you're the tree mugger. Okay. So we go out there, and he takes just a, a cable saw, okay, which is essentially just a piece of cable, and he just goes around the outside of the tree with it and cuts about this far in, just enough to sever the phloem all the way around the tree. Okay, It's not something anyone would notice unless they looked really closely at the tree. So these trees start leaking sap like crazy, okay, and they start getting really sick because the roots aren't getting any sugar. And so they're not able to support their cells. They're not getting any food. So these trees get really sick. We're thinking, yes, these trees are going to die. They're going to cut them down. We'll get our field back. Okay, this is going to be great. Wrong. They came out a few weeks later, and they made these paper mache casts. I, I, no word of a lie. Like They made them out of newspaper. And even a year later, you could still read the comic strip in the tree. It was starting to grow over it, but you could still see some of the characters as the tree grew over these paper mache casts that they used as a big giant band-aid around the, the ring that we had made on all these trees. It was in the, the university newspaper that these vandals had tried to kill the trees. It was us, but, okay. um, anyway, we, we had rung the trees and it was working because we disrupted the flow of sugar, but they put paper mache over because what's paper made out of? Yeah pulp and stuff like that. So they just put that over and the tree just naturally grew right over it. Okay? And now those trees have this kind of lump right where that had happened. You can't see the, the newspaper anymore because they've grown kind of that barky, woody tissue over it because obviously they put another layer on every year. So we failed. We had a good plan. Okay? But uh, as, as people are, are fond of saying, all plans survive until first contact with the enemy. That was our plan. All right, questions there? All right. Okay, so the xylem, okay, transports water up the plant, uses the polar nature of water. We talked about that. Okay, so we got adhesion against the sides of the xylem wall, okay, and we've got cohesion between the water molecules, okay, hydrogen bonds being very important there, okay. Uh, so water evaporates from the leaves, okay. So as water evaporates from the leaves, the remaining solution becomes more concentrated, and that pulls water up to balance the concentration. Okay, so that's that's where osmosis becomes important. Okay, 
So osmosis, adhesion, and cohesion of water molecules. Super important in transporting water. Okay, and then the phloem. Okay, the phloem transports sugars, okay, and it moves it down. Now what, how do they, how does the sugar move down? We got osmosis moving water up, but what moves the sugar down? Gravity, simple. I mean, why, why, why reinvent the wheel? Okay, gravity is free, okay, it moves in a downwards direction, so sap just moves through the phloem by gravity, okay, and that allows the plant to not expend any energy, okay, in, uh, in moving this, the uh, sugary sap down. What does a plant need to do in the winter time? You got water inside the trunk of a tree in the winter time. What'll happen to the tree? Okay, if it freezes, the water freezes. The water will expand and it'll break the tree. Okay, you can see this happen sometimes if we get a really hard freeze after the the trees have leaves on them. Okay, you'll see that some of the trees will will literally crack. Okay, on the trunk from the inside, if the water inside freezes, it's just like anything else, it'll crack. Same thing happens if a tree gets struck by lightning. Okay, evaporated water takes up more space than liquid water does. Okay, and if you boil the sap inside a tree, which is what happens if it gets struck by lightning, the tree explodes. Okay, it doesn't crack, it explodes. Anyone been next to a tree when that happens? It is scary. Okay. Not only because there's this giant flash, huge cracking boom that nearly deafens you, and then there's pieces of tree raining down on you afterwards. Okay, it's it's actually quite scary. Um, so that if the lightning strikes the tree, there's enough energy in there that all of the sap, xylem sap and phloem sap, boils, and when it boils, it just pushes out, and the the branches of the tree just literally explode, and there's splinters everywhere. All right. Um, so yeah, it can be kind of scary. I say that from personal experience. I've been close to it happening twice. Okay, um, I used to work at a golf course, so you're kind of outside all the time, and you, know, you got a loud machine. You don't really notice that there's thunder because you can't hear it through your earplugs and the machine running, and then all of a sudden a tree explodes. And you're sitting on a big giant hunk of metal in the middle of a thunderstorm. So yeah, you kind of want to avoid stuff like that if at all possible. Okay, um, all right. So that's what we need to know about the phloem. Let's have you answer those questions here real quick, and then we'll go over them together. Whoops. Okay, so let's have a look at these here. So what process or properties are used in both intracellular transport and transport in multicellular organisms? What's the big one? Osmosis is definitely a big part of that. Okay, it also mentioned uh, that when phloem sap is moving downwards that often diffusion will also help keep um, the fluid levels kind of right within the within the phloem sap so diffusion is also a big part of that active transport on a large organism scale not really okay unless you count like you know your circulatory system as active transport but active transport is really more the pumping of nutrients and and solutes and things like that across a membrane and so that's not really something that would happen on a large scale. Okay, so mostly we're looking at osmosis being the primary one, diffusion also playing a small part. Okay, um, okay. if you're tapping a maple tree to harvest sap for syrup, which transporting tissue would you tap? Right, you want to tap the phloem. Tapping the xylem is only going to get you yucky tasting water, right? It's also not going to come out very well because it's trying to move upwards. Uh, so you tap the phloem because you want the sugary sap that's very slowly running down the tree. Now, we all have this idea because, you know, we're Canadian, you know, maple is a big thing for us, okay, that when we see this tap go into this tree that it's like this long, right? but in reality, it's only about this long, okay? It just barely goes into the bark, right? So it goes in and then uh, it catches the sap as it comes down. Now, how quickly do you suppose that sap comes out? Very slow, especially if it's cold outside. All right, it doesn't run hardly at all when it's cold. So uh, we're looking at, you know, this is a, a seasonal harvest because they're only making sap when the leaves are on the trees. This isn't something that's going to happen in the winter. Okay. Um, so it's a seasonal harvest and it's very, very slow. That's why real maple syrup 
is really expensive, and Aunt Jemima is really cheap, okay? Because it's not real maple syrup, right? It's just high fructose corn syrup and some flavoring, okay? Whereas real maple syrup is actually, you know, sugar added, obviously, but it's maple sap, okay, that's been boiled and whatever, all right? Um, so, three, in the leaf, why are so many cells packed together near the surface of the leaf? Better results, better surface area for photosynthesis, okay? And how are they continually supplied with water? Okay, osmosis helps the spongy layer brings water into the, into the leaf, and then it moves from the spongy layer into those palisade cells. Oh, excuse me, into those palisade cells through osmosis and diffusion, okay, moving that way. All right, um, number four. Would a plant be able to transport water to its leaves more easily or less easily on a humid day? It would be. Okay, lower concentration of salt, and if I've already got a lot of water vapor in the air, how easy is it for water vapor to move from leaves to the air? Natural processes, we want to go from high to low. But what if, if we've got lots of water in the air, it might appear not so low from the point of view of the water in the plant. So if it gets really, really humid, like 100% you know, humidity, it might be di more difficult to move water and evaporate it that way. Okay. All right, and number five, you have a plant that does not look very full, only a few stringy branches. What would you do to give it a more full appearance? Trim it, okay? Trim it back so it's got to grow from the buds that are further back, okay? If it had one stringy branch, trim it back to where you saw two buds. Now it'll have three branches, okay? Because it'll grow from those two buds and from the branch you cut off, okay? And, and you'll get more foliage on the outside. Mm-hmm. That, there's, you know what? That's a good question. It uh, it's mostly has to do with that they can pull a lot of really salty stuff from the soil. So they can, again, they can draw a lot of salt into the leaf and really kind of force it out. Okay. Yeah. All right, the really tall ones, they kind of get above the canopy. It's less humid when you get above the canopy as well. So the top, the canopy of the rainforest is in drier air because it's so high. All right, number five, you have a plant that does not look very full. Oh, sorry, I already did that one. Wow, I'm losing it. Jeez. Okay, well, I know that. I'm getting old. Okay, all right. Um, so we'll end it there, guys.